get you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do the do our slideshow part from the beginning. Okay. So you remember on that last Thursday when we were still here before the break, we talked about. Um, the, the cells in that symphony of science, and I had written this down about every cell is a triumph of natural selection and how the MRSA and, and all that can, um, that they're trying to triumph. As, um, and we can have, we have some of those additives to our antibiotics that can help to, to uh, keep those cells from becoming resistant, hopefully. So, and then we are each of us a multitude. We are a multitude of our own cells, but, but we have talked about last semester too, where we have so many microbes in our body that, that are not our cells, that, and that they, a lot of them are helpful to us. Some of them can be harmful, but a lot, a lot of them are helpful. So we're in, in several ways, we are a multitude. So anyway, let's just let's see if I can get my thumb to do right here. Oh, it's too far. Here we go. All right, I'm not going to go over every bit of this because this is this is anatomy and physiology. I guess I need to cut the light off too or cut it down. It's kind of dim outside, but I'm going to see if that'll be good. Or is that is that it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, wow, that worked. Mm -hmm. It's so dark outside now. Okay, and now I'm not going to read all of this to you. You, you <coughs> learned this probably in fifth grade or something, but, but that's just a review that life starts with a single cell and that we have trillions of cells and, and we've got the nucleus and the organelles and all that. What what cell does not have a nucleus when it's mature? Red blood cells. Red blood cells, right, right. And so you, you can kind of tell that, the, the, like the empty part of that, that discoid shape of this uh, nucleus used to be um, when it was an immature red blood cell. So, okay. And this other... The next one is, this is all those different, the different um, parts of the cell, and that's, again, that's a review from anatomy and physiology, and you probably did learn that in, in um, junior high biology, but the, just, just so you, you know, we want to really focus on the nucleus, which is the, the brain of the cell, of course, not the red blood cell, but um, it, it is a sitting permeable membrane, meaning things can go um, in and out. And you do have the, the chromosomes, or chromatin bundles, and that contains the DNA, and that has the, the genes that, that give the body the instructions on, um, on all of our inherited characteristics. And then the, the nucleolus, or nucleolus, it depends on how, how you've heard it um, pronounced, but it does make the RNA, and that makes the ribosomes and the, the centrosomes aid in the cell division. But all, all we're, we're talking about mainly here is, is the cell division process is what, what's going on with, with the cellular regulation part. And then um, the, um, the ribosomes are on the endoplasmic reticulum or looking in the cytoplasm, and they actually make what? So the, the DNA is in the nucleus, but what about the... What's in the ribosomes? Okay. RNA is where that they are made of RNA, and that they produce enzymes and proteins to repair and, and reproduce cells. And then um, on the on the number nine, the DNA and the genes uh, that's in every cell except for the, the RBCs. And uh, then we've got our A AGTC. Okay, so our A stands for what? Y'all remember that? Mm. So every cell has about six feet worth of DNA. And then how many pairs of chromosomes do we have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have y'all noticed that that uh, sculpture right beside the, the entrance to the elevator on the first floor? Mm -hmm. What is that? DNA. DNA. Yeah, it's a DNA. Strand. Yeah, it's a, it's a DNA strand, so and it's, it's the double helix. Is, is that familiar to y'all? The double helix. I just think that's really a, a cool thing. Has anybody been to um, to the 
46 restaurant in Annapolis? Yeah, and what does the 46 stand for, Jeff? The chromosomes, right, exactly, so. And then in the bathroom, um, how do you know which is the boys' bathroom? Did you? XY, right. We got X, X, and XY. Right, so you have to know. Now, what's your chromosome? Now, what's that? You're not so sure you remember which one. Just remember you've got one of each, and the girls just got two X's. Um, anyway, we have 22 pairs of non sex chromosomes. Those are called autosomes. And then we have um, one pair of sex chromosomes, of course, X, the XX or the XY. And there can be defects in that sometimes, but that's the normal. Okay, so, so we'll just go on from there. All right, I just think this is a gorgeous picture with the color and everything. It doesn't look good if you've got it just printed out. But this has all those, um, all those portions of the, the cell. And of course, here's where we're talking about is our, our nucleus and our, our nucleus. And there's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then the ribosomes are the little little dotted things that that um, are made out of RNA. So, um, <clears throat> some of the things that I, I have on in my notes, I'm not gonna um, like gonna give you. I'm not gonna read every word here to you, but this is very very important to know what normal cells do, so that you can understand the abnormals. So the the um, normal cell has limited cell division. There are regulations that, that stop cell division when we don't need it and start cell division when we do need it. The word apoptosis, does anybody know what that is? Yeah, right, programmed cell death, exactly. And one of, one of my sons said he had heard that word before when I, he was looking over my shoulder when I was doing slides and he, he said, oh, I know that word. I said, how could you know that word? <laughs> okay, I guess I guess video games can, can be educational then. But anyway, the apoptosis um, means that cells are supposed to be mortal. But the cells will, will eventually die. They have a limited lifespan. Um, and in a normal cell, this doesn't take this nucleus does not take up most of the cytoplasm, do, does it? So you you do have a a small nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. So th this is what a normal cell does look like. And um, so there's more cytoplasm than there is nucleus. And then the, you do have a specific differentiated function. We'll talk about differentiation again in a little while, but that means that it does have a specific purpose. And it also has tight adherence to neighboring cells. I call it fibronectin, and I've heard it mentioned as cadherin in a video that I had seen about vitamin D and and how it, it helps cells to be, to be protected against cancer and all that. So that, that's one of those things in, in theory that they're, they're hoping that they can learn more about vitamin D to, um, to learn what, how much do we need to, to um, aid in our um, cellular regulation process. But um, they're also <clears throat> um, non-migratory, except which, which cells are migratory? The, most cells are non-migratory, but what, which ones do migrate? Well, what normal cells do go through the body? Blood cells, right, right. We got our platelets and our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and um, the, the, the antibodies and things like that that go through, um, through the body and be migrate. Okay, and there is well-regulated, orderly growth patterns. And there is contact inhibition. They do, they do stay together with that fibronectin, but there is some degree of, of contact contact inhibition as well. Um, it's like, don't don't get in my bubble. Have you ever had anybody to come just right, right in your face and you just, just right, like you really wouldn't prefer that they be there kind of thing? And you're just like, okay, I've got a bubble here and you're, you're in it and I don't find it. You know, that's that's what, what, that, what that means with this contact inhibition. Okay, and euploidy, that's a, that's a really wacky word, but ploidy really means um, the the chromosomal status. You, what does EU mean as a prefix? Like if you say euphemia with breathing, it means for, and the opposite of, of euphemia would be dyspnea. So what do you think EU means? Easy. It means easy or good or, yes, exactly. All right. So anyway, the, 
it means a good toity is that you have 23 pairs of, of chromosomes. You've got 46 chromosomes total, and there are 22 pairs of autosomes and the two six chromosomes, like we mentioned before. So, um, <clears throat> what kind of um, normal body cells do divide a lot throughout the lifespan? Skin. Skin. Hair. Hair, yeah. yeah. And fingernails and, 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 and the stomachs. Yeah, the lining, the mucous membrane lining and everything. Yeah. And um, which ones don't? Heart, heart cells, brain cells, cells and heart cells. Um, heart cells and all that. They can. Heart cells can get bigger if there's damage. Um, they can they can have the hyper um, hypertrophy, but they they don't. They you don't know, make more um, of the heart cells. They just they just get scarred. Okay. The cell cycle. We have mitosis and meiosis. What are the kinds of cells that undergo meiosis? Six cells. What's that? The sex cells do meiosis, and then the mitosis is the cell cell division, and it is controlled by cyclins, and then um, differentiation is is um, is what what happens. Okay, so in the somatic cells where, or the autosomes is where where we, we have the mitosis, and um, then the meiosis is the reduction division in the sex cells of the testes and the ovaries uh, before they they combine. Um, the cyclins make sure that the cell cycle progresses in, in the correct order. And the, the body will actually stop the process of the of cell division if there are errors in the process. It's sort of like a spell check on the, on the computer. There are all kinds of genes that, that um, see to it that this happens and the, and the, the, the cyclins um, do that, that as well. But just, I think the, the main point, whether you know what cyclin is or which gene it is, is that there is control um, to suppress unneeded cellular regulation or cellular um, reproduction. It will regulate the cell um, and regulates the cell's reproduction. And that if there's some kind of problem, then then it, it kicks that cell out and the, um, the, the cell grows up to kind of apoptosis, and then, then the body tries to recycle the, the uh, byproducts. So. Okay, differentiation is when the, the cells are prepared over lots and lots of cycles to perform specific functions in the body, like um, nerves, muscles, skin, organs, all that sort of thing. And in the in your your reading, um, in the the Iggy book and in, in the Giddens book, they, they give a little more detail about the normal cell division being a balance between the cyclins that promote the cell division and then the suppressor genes that, that limit the cell division. And that, I think that's a really interesting um, uh, discussion there that they, they have in those books. And um, it, it um, helps you to only, only produce new cells if, if you're replacing um, cells that have been, been destroyed or they've been damaged. Um, or if you're just trying to, to make some normal tissue, or just like if there's a lot more cell division in a child, of course, than there is in an adult. Um, and then um, if, it's, if they're not, if, if the body doesn't need cell division to take place at that particular time, then, then it, it gets turned off and there is, it is a control. And so that's, that's the main thing is that normal cells do have uh, growth regulation and control. Okay, now this, this one is, I think this is in your, your book now, in one of your books, I can't remember which it is now, but I, I've kept this one for, for a while. This is just a really great um, picture of an embryonic cell at about five days after conception. So um, that's, there. I did not learn about cellular regulation this way. And I learned about it after I started teaching, actually, because this is something that they didn't really relate together until, until fairly recently, at least in my career. So the early embryonic cells, just after fertilization and before implantation, they have really fast <coughs> and continuous cell division. It takes them two to eight hours to divide for the first eight days. 
They don't respond to signals for apoptosis. But that's normal in an embryonic cell. It's, it's supposed to do that. That's, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And they, they call it an anaplastic morphology. They're small and round, and they don't have any identity. If you remember when we had a picture, of, we have the picture of the red blood cell and the nerve cell and a skin cell mm -hmm. kind of together, and they all looked very, very different because of the type of function that, that they will perform. This is not, this is, doesn't have any differentiated function, so it doesn't have any uh, differentiated shape either. It's just, just uh, rounded. And there is a large nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. There's more nucleus than there is cytoplasm. And then that, again, that's normal in embryonic cells. Hmm. And all they know how to do is die. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. So, um, and they have loose adherence. They don't have that fiber nectar. They can migrate around within um, within that, that cell. That means those the embryonic cells or in, within that capsule. And um, until till the um, till it's implanted, until the blastocyst is implanted, and they are um, they don't have the contact inhibition. They don't they don't care if anybody gets right up in their face. And they, they they just they don't worry about that. And then about day eight, everything changes. They're, um, the substance is called proto oncogenes. Start that that's what started that early rapid growth in cell division, um, that, that's turned off about day eight, when the, which the other words can be, uh, instead of just turned off, suppressed is, a, is one of the words, or tightly controlled. And then other genes are expressed, means they're, they're turned on to be able to determine the specific structure and function to get those cells to commit to a specific um, type of function that the body is going to need. And uh, they, you call that a committed differentiated cell. So differentiated means that the cell knows what, it fun what its function is supposed to, to be and, and it actually does perform that function properly. So I'm going to see if I can get my, my YouTube to... Because um, that, that is exactly what it is supposed to be doing. There's really no regulation except that those proto-oncogenes have just told those cells to divide and that's what they're doing. And that's that's all they're doing. So I'm gonna get this back to the, the genome instead of saying quite so dark. That still seems kind of it was dimmer before. Is that too dark? Mm -hmm. Are y'all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can, I can see my notes so I don't forget to tell you anything. All right. Um, the, the next slide just tells you about the other kinds of, of growth. When, have y'all heard of, of um, hyper, hypertrophy and hyperplasia? Mm -hmm. That when, it in, when cells increase in size, um, then that's hypertrophy. But when there are, are more cells, then, then that's hyperplasia. And so um, when, when you have the, you, you remember BPH? I bet a lot of y'all have had patients in clinical already with BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, you've got bigger cells. Um, and sometimes you can have hyperplasia too. Um, one of the side effects to some, to like Dilantin, some, some seizure medicines can be gingival, the gums, hyperplasia. If you see, I don't think that they even have, have people um, to take enough of that to, to cause so much of the, that problem before. But people that have epilepsy and have taken the, the uh, Dilantin all their, all their life. I know when I was growing up um, and, and I would see people with, with seizures. I remember my granddaddy's church, there was a fellow that would have seizures sometimes at, at church and you could tell that his gums were like swollen looking and that, that's like a hyperplasia that, that like, it increases the, the um, production of the, of the cells in there. So anyway, that, that just gives you the, dif the differentiation between, okay, the original hypertrophy and hyperplasia, and then we'll talk about any other, other kind of abnormal kind of things. They are, um, both of these are under normal DNA control, and, um, and so that it's, it's not, it, is, it can be like from um, increase of, um, for metabolic demands, increased hormone levels or stress to the, to the body. The hormone levels is like for the BPH, um, but it is reversible. And uh, 
oh, I did, I did have that in my notes too about the Delant, the P-H-E-N-Y-T-O-I-N is the, the, um, the generic name of that. Okay. All right, so we're talking about our, our um, alterations or, the, of course, the hyperplasia, hypertrophy. Then we've got the metaplasia. Um, you you uh, find those kinds of cells that are not normally in that particular location in the body, and that can be like, when, where, what is a disease or a problem where you've got, got cells that are from, from one place that are, that are growing in another place? I guess that type of pregnancy could be, but but um, but that's uh, it, it is a, a GYN thing. Thinking about what, what about endometriosis? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really really big one there. And there's actually actually people can have lesions in their lung that are actually um, endometriosis, and that can that can really cause some problems. Every time the the cycle, the monthly cycle, goes on with the hormonal. Um, fluctuations and everything, then there, there can be, be problems there. So that usually like, with the hormone treatment. But it is definitely reversible when the stressor is removed or you like, like or you change the, the hormonal um, stimulation. Okay, so so um, the neoplasia means new, new growth. These are just some terms that you want. Because neo, you can tell neo is a, it means new. And uh, it, it's a mass of new tissue. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a benign or malignant. It's just new tissue. So dis, what does dis mean? Bad. Bad. So then we start to lose some DNA control with dysplasia um, over the differentiation. And um, it can be a response to adverse conditions. Um, the cells can vary in size or shape or appearance from the normal and, of course, function as, as well. Um, and like... Um, when, when um, there's cervical changes to the, the um, HPV virus, and um, then uh, that can be reversible. Though. Dysplasia can still be reversible. And then anaplasia. That is, that is not good. Anaplastic. Except anaplasia is good in embryonic cells that we just saw. Anaplasia means they don't, they don't have any, um, they, they're just rounded, they don't have any specific uh, shape or function at that particular time. So, so that's the only time that, that anaplasia is good is in the embryos. Um, so anyway, the, the cell regresses to an, to an immature or an undifferentiated cell type. It doesn't have DNA control anymore. Um, and then the, the dividing cell loses its, its useful function. And anaplasia is not reversible. So um, any Alterations in cellular regulation could become cancerous or, or compromise plant, plant health, of course. So, so that's, that's a, a good thing to remember. Sorry, my thumb's doing the right there again here. This is really, um, this is carcinoma in situ, where it's, it's, um, it's sort of encapsulated. And that's one of the things they're, they're, they've been um, kind of, I don't want to say arguing about, but there's a controversy about when is it cancer and when is it not. Have y'all heard that just in the last year that they, they said some, some um, carcinomas in situ are not being um, called ca cancer anymore. Um, they just are calling it severe dysplasia, but it, it could be become cancerous and you have to look at each, each person's um, situation individually instead of, um, instead of trying to just make a snap decision that everybody that has some of these bad cells is is going to have to have the same treatment. So um, it, it's right now there's there's a lot of uh, play in it in um, individualized care, but but um, we we are going to have to to probably make some some hard and fast definitions. But we got normal cells. We've got our lots of extra cells, hyperplasia, lots more cells than you need, then mild dysplasia, there's there's sort of the shapes and sizes are a little different and they're not exactly fitting in to the, the area where they're supposed to fit in. And now these are definitely different kinds of cells and they got the great big nuclei and that's the severe dysplasia. But then now this is cancer. This is not just dysplasia. This is when it is cancer is invasive. That's that's the key word. It is, when it is it's cancer invasive is the is the big differentiator to to say that um, you know that that's when those cells are are um, 
are they, like the cows out of the barn? Are they? It is. It, is, it, it potentially can spread to other places. <laughs> okay, had to had to put my little crab picture on there. So it is a, um, cancer uncontrolled growth, the spread of abnormal cells, and it can affect any body tissue. It's just that some some are more common than others. To be and then oncology is the study of cancer, um, and so that's that's. The, the word anyway, oncology. That's, you know, I'm, I'm an oncology certified nurse. That's, that's one of my specialty is. <clears throat> okay. I did not, I usually go every year into the, the um, American Cancer Society website and put up another set of statistics, and it's not really changed that much, and your book hasn't, hasn't changed that much on this anyway, but what I want you to see from this is that the number one cause of death in in the United States is what? Heart, Heart disease. disease. But cancer's number two though. So just, just know that. That is something just important. Every educated nurse needs to know that cancer's cancer's number two to heart disease. Okay? And that's the that's really the the big takeaway here. So and um, what I had done on the notes page, because I did go in last year, I couldn't get it to format right, and I did do a, an update from the 2010. This was 2007. If you really want the numbers, that's what's on the on my notes page there. The um, for the, the 2010, that was the, the most recent um, one um, that they had had used. Y'all actually have one of these diagrams in in Iggy, but this was the one that came from the the um, website from 2013. So this this is something that I I definitely definitely want you to to know, and and I want you to know them in order. So this is just a memorization thing, and I promise you it is on the test. So if you just if you will know this, you're going to get two questions right. Okay. So and I've already told you about some math too. So if you y'all got all that, you're you can have you can have 12 points or something anyway, right? So all right. So with males, this is estimated new cases, or that's the incidence. How often does it occur? So with men, men it is prostate's number one, and, and then lung and bronchus is, is two, and then colorectal is three. And then the incidence with females, number one is breast, Number two is the lung and bronchus, and number three is, is colorectal. So, so that's pretty. That's pretty good. Men and women are, are number two and number three is the same for men and women. And then the the incidence, um, the the top incidence is the hormonal. And and so if you can remember that, the um, the prostate for for men is number one, and the breast is is number one for women. So I want you to know those in order. Prostate, lung, and bronchus, colorectal, breast, lung, and bronchus, colorectal for the incidence. How often does it occur? Estimated deaths. So we, we've got a little flip-flop there, don't we? So the, the lung, lung cancer deaths are, are decreasing somewhat because, well, partly because of fewer people um, are, are smoking within certain age groups, and then there's some that it's it's, it's increasing, and some younger people are are starting to, to, to do that again too. But um, it it had been growing in in females. Um, more more women have been smoking, and there was more incidence of the, the lung and bronchus cancer. But um, but uh, the the fact that females are are, are trying to, to stop smoking more now than than um, it has decreased some, but it's still number one cause of death. And then here's our hormonally controlled ones that um, flip flop. So lung and bronchus, prostate, lung and bron bronchus, breast, and then it, the third cause of death. It's the third in incidence and the third in, in cause of death um, for for both men and women. So that's just statistics, but statistics are really it is really important for us to. To know that, and, and again, a, an educated nurse, even if you're not an oncology nurse, you really should know this. So, anyway, um, let's see if I had. I don't think there was anything new there. It was just interpretation of, the, of that slide. Some of these are really just FYIs. 
Okay, the, the lifetime probability of developing cancer for men, um, and, and um, this is not this is really this is not the newest one, and there's there's some more recent ones in, in your book. But this just gives you an idea that that uh, which ones are, are more uh, more common in in um, in the, the men, and okay and I, I do have um, a, a website for the update of this it's sort of like when you're looking at um, the CDC website for vaccinations you know it does change and it may not change a whole lot but it does change and so that there's a website on that notes page if you want if you ever want to look that that up for the very most um, most recent statistic and then this is for the women the, and it says breast, lung, and bronchus, colon, and rectum, and just how, how likely it is a um, probability over the lifetime. You do not have to memorize that. That just gives you a perspective about what, what other ones um, come after, after these. All right. This one is, um, there are some cancers where African-American death rates exceed white death rates. Um, and so this this gives you a sort of a, a perspective that African American men are more likely to develop prostate cancer than men of any other ethnic or racial group. And I don't think it exactly says that on here, but that's that's the that is the fact. African American men are more likely to develop prostate cancer than men of any other ethnic or racial group. So, and it um, and it is actually and and uh, there's on page four oh four oh six. Um, in Iggy, it, it talks about cultural and racial differences. And then in women for which African American death rates exceed white, white death rates, um, these are not really in, in order either, but um, the biggie to know here is that African American women have less incidence of breast cancer than white women do, but they're about 28% more likely to die from it. So that's that's a um, that's something that that is a demographic that the the um, American Cancer Society is trying to to target to see okay why I mean what do you think some of the reasons might be insurance. yeah insurance, insurance and and, uh, and and poverty I mean it, it's just it is just a, a fact we hate to um, admit that sometimes but that it is just a fact there are, are more African American women that, that um, live live in poverty. I think it is a, a little bit different with the with the prostate cancer, but that's probably a factor with the prostate cancer as well. But the the incidence is is greater in in the African American men for some reason. Um, but but anyway, they they think that it may just be less likely that that these women would be um, diagnosed at the earlier stages, like the the cause white women are more likely to be diagnosed at earlier stages. So. Um, anyway, that's it, the unequal access to medical care. I think is, is one of the biggies. That's kind of from the, the uh, health care unit that that Ms. Chandler taught. And then it's it's not really fun to learn that stuff to begin with. But when you start seeing how you can apply it, 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 it really does. And some of the, those health care statistics and all that really do make a difference to to real people. All right, I think this is, a, I've, I've got lots of pictures here that really say the same thing, but I just think it's neat to see how this is a graphic of the normal and then the cancer is just real chaotic looking. Um, large variable shaped nuclei, small cytoplasm volume relative to the, to the nuclei, variation in cell size and shape, all of the, um, all of the, the cells from, from a particular tissue ought to look the same. But this, these are varied when they're cancerous. And the loss of normal specialized cell features, this was this looks sort of like a nerve cell. Mm -hmm. And these are just this kind of shriveled up and weird looking. And then disorganized arrangement and poorly <coughs> defined tumor boundaries. So those, those kinds of things can be, be really, really important. And I'm going to go back to the back so I can, I can see this better because I've got to see you know, the middle. The jaw's turning out. Okay, so this <coughs> Tumor, like a brain tumor that's called benign, it means it's not invasive. 
That's the biggest thing. It's not invasive. It might, it might be putting pressure on some important areas of the brain, though, to where it may not be compatible with life. So it gets it sometimes uh, benign lesions can kill you because of the just expansion that they do. They reproduce by expansion, not by invasion. But expansion can kill you too sometimes. But, uh, but the invasiveness is, is the key word there. So um, I think y'all can really um, look at those, at those listings was the difference between the cancer cell and the, and the normal cell. But the cancer cell characteristics are that they rapid or continuous cell division or when it's not needed by the body um, it does not respond to signals for apoptosis. Those, those cells can be immortal. When we get to 211AB, I hope I can do this again. Um, that last year I, I showed parts of, of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Has anybody heard that before? There's actually a, a book that, that um, when my son started in the state several years He's a junior now. But they, they always have, the, I think the North Carolina University system always has a book that they want the students to, to read and then they go over it in their, their freshman class, the, whatever the, I don't remember what you call that, the preparatory class where you learn how to be a student and all that kind of stuff and then how to be a good student. But um, it, it was about a, a woman with cervical cancer that's, whose cells were just tremendously, they, like they wouldn't die, they usually, the cancer cells, if you put them in a culture dish, will eventually die, they'll sort of overcrowd each other and, and just stop dividing the colony and just die um, because they're in a limited um, nourishment of, of environment or whatever. But the Henrietta Lachis cells just kept on growing and they are still growing and she died in the uh, 1950s. Or mm. But it is really, really interesting to, to see some of that. But if that's what her, it is the immortal life of Henrietta Lachis. A lot of her cells are still alive, but she's not. You know, it's really, it's really a strange mm. story. Um, but anyway, the, the uh, large nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio is what you see with the, um, with the abnormal cells, uh, the, the cancer cells, and then they do definitely lose their differentiated function um, and their, their shape and all that can, can sort of show you that. Lose the adherence, no fibronectin, um, and that they're like embryonic cells, um, and they're not, uh, they're not cohesive. Okay, and that's, that. I do have that have it uh, in, in hot pink on my notes anyway. Growth by invasion. They do not stop at the tissue border. This is the most important distinction between normal and cancer cells. Invasiveness. Just remember invasiveness if you don't remember anything else. So, okay. And it is not contact inhibited and aneuploid. I don't really know why they put an in it's like not euploid. Euploid means good chromosomes, but an euploid means not good chromosomes. So anyway, um, that means that you're, you, uh, you might have more than 23 pairs of chromosomes, or you may have abnormal structure of the chromosomes. Maybe there's pieces missing or, or extra pieces where they've switched around pieces from one chromosome but jump to another chromosome and can cause problems. So, um, Anyway, that's that's when that's the ploidy word if, if you've ever seen the aim ploid part. And it is good time to have a break, isn't it? Alright, this is another another video about the loss of normal growth control. It's really the same the same concept we talked about a while ago. Um, normal growth control. Normal tissues, the rates of the new cell growth and the old cell death are kept in balance, and we've already said that by the cyclins and the suppressor genes and all that sort of thing. Um, when you got the balance disrupted, then then we've got a, um, a problem. Um, and if there if the uh, cell cannot undergo cell suicide, that's what this source says. Then then um, the apoptosis isn't happening. Then then we get loss of the normal growth control. And that's, that's how old or damaged cells usually do self-destruct, especially the ones that really have to work so hard so fast. Like, um, what, what white blood cell reproduces really, 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 really fast? Neutrophil cells, absolutely. So they, they may, if they're working really hard, they may just live for four to eight hours or something like that. So, so um, they, they work hard and then they get destroyed and they get replaced. And that's, that's normal in that type of a cell because the body does need it. Okay, and um, in, in your Giddens book, 
she, she expressed it a little bit differently, so I, I wrote this down in my notes that um, more than one incorrect stop or go signal um, has to happen for, for cancer to occur. There's a whole lot of checks and balances, suppressor genes and, and, um, and then other genes that are turned on and all this sort of thing. Um, but but uh, if some of the suppressor genes get damaged or are not working properly, or it has some genetic problem that you don't don't have those suppressor genes, and then then you have uh, exposure to some sort of environmental problem that that uh, damages the genes as well, then that's that's when cancer can happen. It's usually that that was always Dr. Black, um, the doctor I worked for. That was always his, his uh, big word was multifactorial. Cancer is multifactorial, the causes of cancer. So it's not just one thing. There may be one big thing that kind of puts, you know, it's just kind of breaks the camel's back or something. But, but um, it, it, it's multiple things going wrong that, that cause it to, to happen. So, um, and there is a table in um, 10-1, and it's a page number, but anyway, it's in there. Okay, the process of cancer development. If we, here's our, the initiation phase. I think this is a great, great slide here. Initiation. Uh, viruses, hormones, radiation, chemicals, hereditary factors, unknown factors can cause the cell to, to, al to be altered and the DNA to be altered. There's dysfunction in the differentiation and proliferation and it develops into a cancer cell. Then promotion is the second one where the proliferation at the, of the mitotic rate of the tissue of origin um, changes. And then progression is evidence of clinical disease where you can see it on an x-ray, but it, it has to be almost as big as around the, as your little finger to, even to see it like on an MRI or a, or a CT scan or an x-ray. Um, so, and that's, that's a lot of cells. And, but anyway, then, then you can have uh, evidence of clinical disease and then possibly it can spread to other places and that, that is, is metastasis. And this is a very, very busy page on, the, on this slide. So this is very, very important. So initiation is irreversible. It causes permanent damage to that cellular DNA. That doesn't necessarily mean that that cell is um, not going to be caught by the the immune system, the immune system can find those cells and, and destroy them. That's part of the immune system's function. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die of cancer just because you have that irreversible change. But it is initiation is the irreversible of the, the proto oncogenes turned back on. Now when did the pro when is it normal for the proto oncogenes to cause unregulated cell development? Embryo. Right. Embryo, right? That's the only time that it should be unregulated development like that. And then when it comes to like the day, um, day five to eight, then uh, in the implantation process happens, then then that's it's not ever normal again for it to do that. So <clears throat> anyway, the the um, the damage to genes that was not repaired or had an effective repair. Um, where the suppressor genes are turned off and genes that should stay quiet are turned on. Turned on means express, express means turned on. So if you go over express, that means that the gene is turned on to where it is working on the cell. Okay, on the genes are genes that when do, when they are expressed or they are turned on, um, it causes the change from the normal cells to the cancer cell and promotes the, the proliferation. And um, you've probably heard of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 that are, are uh, in, that runs in families um, for, for breast cancer and um, ovarian cancer and sometimes colon cancer is, is part of that process as well. Um, and you, you can, it can be passed down from, from the father's side as well. It's not, not just the mother's side, but, but um, it's, it's usually a, in, in uh, women that you see that it's really cancer like that. Um, and if, you're, if your body is stressed, like emotional stress or, or physical stress, um, if you've been, been sick a long time with some really bad infection, or if you're taking immunosuppressants, um, if you've had an organ transplant and you're taking anti-rejection drugs, something like that, um, that's, that's when you can, you can see some of the, um, the balance getting, getting out of whack to where, where the immune system's not able to, 
to pull its weight and, and, um, and detect those initiated cells and, and take care of them and get, get rid of them so that they don't become invasive and, and reproduce and go, go all over the body. So the tumor suppressor genes do um, maintain control over the, the, cell, the cell cycle and prevent overexpression of, of oxygen. So this this is really perfect. Really complicated. It's even more complicated than what I have on the slide. They've learned so much more in the last um, probably 10 years about suppressor genes and the, a lot of therapy is, is, um, uh, is, targeting, is targeting the, the um, enhancement of the suppressor genes when they're needed and, and to, to be able to suppress the, the, um, the genetic problems or, or um, pathways that, that um, do um, encourage the cell division, and control the cell division. So anyway, P53 is one of the tumor suppressor genes. That's one of the first ones that they discovered. But there are lots, lots, lots more than that. Um, and uh, you don't have to really remember that. That's not necessarily something you have to know as a generalist nurse. But, but that is an example of one of the P53. OK. Um, so like the promotion part is the enhancing the growth of the cancer cells that's already been initiated. We've already got that irre irreversible change in the, the immune system is not caught it. We know stages and all not heated up and got rid of it. So um, the promoters don't actually cause cancer. The initiation has to happen first. And, but um, if you do alcohol and smoking at the same time and then it repeatedly acts on the already initiated cell, um, those could be those can be initiators and promoters actually. You can it can initiate the cell but then it can promote over time as, as well. It's usually it's just a slow, slow process for most people. And then the progression is the presence of a detectable tumor, which is so on your picture there. And it, it, um, it makes the, the cells able to promote their own survival. And uh, they, they can pr produce hormones themselves, or they can actually cause organs that produce hormones to produce abnormal amounts of the hormones. The ectopic hormone production, that's like ectopic pregnancy. It's, it's in the wrong place. It's, it's doing the wrong thing. Um, but that can be uh, antidiuretic hormone or adrenocorticotropic uh, hormone, insulin, parathyroid hormone, those are just examples. Do y'all know what angiogenesis means? What's angio? It is creation of new blood um, supply. Yes, definitely. So, so angiogenesis. Genesis sounds like such a good word, but not, not in this case because it's, it's allowing the, the tumor to, to uh, develop its own blood supply. So then that takes nutrients and blood supply and oxygen and, and perfusion to, um, to your normal cells. So it's just, it can starve um, other, other tissues and organs. And then it can allow um, extension into the surrounding tissues because they're, they're very weak and brittle and not, um, uh, not in real good, good shape like normal cells, I mean, or, I mean normal, normal blood vessels. And so you can, you can uh, penetrate, the cells can actually penetrate those blood vessels, and then the tumor cells get released into the general circulation. And then invasion, that, there's that word invasiveness is happening. And that can make it overtake the adjacent tissue. You can also have local seeding, and, and that's um, more common in the abdominal cavity, especially like with ovarian cancer. It, it tends to, the, the cells will shed off of the abnormal ovary, the, those cancer cells will, will shed into the abdominal um, cavity and then just sort of line the peritoneum and, and, um, and so you can actually, actually have, um, have seeding onto the, onto the peritoneum. You, actually, you also could have seeding if you, like, there have been examples, we've had, had some patients in the past that had um, a cyst on the ovary and they were having pain and, um, and they're not they're a lot of, a lot of uh, um, adverse effects from that and a bloating feeling and all that sort of thing. And so the pain was the, the main issue. They saw the, the cyst, they go in to take the cyst out and then break the, the cyst when they're trying to, to um, uh, remove it. It actually bursts open 
and then all this liquid goes into the abdominal cavity. Well, and then they, they take a sample of some of that liquid and then see on a cytology that there are cancer cells in that liquid that had shed into that cyst, into the liquid in the cyst. And so then there's a potential for seeding all over the abdomen just from spilling that in it. Or if you have an instrument that cuts into an organ um, that has, has cancer cells in it, and then you use that same scalpel somewhere else um, to make another incision, then you can see those cancer cells into another spot, um, and they, they could take hold of the gray. So that, you can actually have, have seeding from an external, but an internal thing where it just naturally drops off over into that abdominal cavity and you can put some to the pancreas. But um, from the organism, uh, but, but also, um, also you could do it mechanically. Yes, Robin. Would they ever do a prophylactic insulation after, after something like that? Just to... Well, actually, that the lady I'm thinking about, we actually did did do. Um, chemotherapy on her because the, the ovary, the, the cyst itself, um, w was was ovarian cancer, and so we did treat her as if it, it had been a, um, one that was aggressive or whatever, even though it had been encapsulated. But by you know since it, since it burst and the cyst burst and the, all those bad cells dropped into the abdomen, they went ahead and treated her as if she already had more more advanced disease than than the encapsulated. But, uh, but yeah, they, what they can do, well, well, we'll talk about this later too with treatment, but, but you can actually um, instill uh, chemotherapy into the abdominal cavity to, to get some of the, those cells to, to die and as a local treatment. So, so um, that's, that's one, one thing that you can do. Okay, and then the, the vascular permeability, they, they do what they can break, break loose enzymes can destroy the, the uh, base of the membranes. Even if they don't have a very good supply, they can have some enzymes that can um, eliminate the physical barriers that we normally have. We normally have that. We normally have strong cell walls and, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, some of these enzymes that, that some cancers can produce can, can cause the invasion um, just by the by lysing, the lysis of, of, the, of the cell walls to go get into to lymphatic vessels and or lymph nodes and, and that sort of thing to, to be able to spread. Okay, so um, metastasis is the formation of, of tumors in other locations besides the, the primary location where it all started. And so it can extend into surrounding tissues or go uh, through blood vessel penetration, release of the tumor cells, as we said, and invasion ability to overtake the invasive tissue um, and, and then in the local cell. Okay, but, but just remember this, this is really, really important, that the blood more metastasis is the most common cause of cancer. So, um, and I, I think this is really interesting. It depends on where you look as to how many cells they say um, present a, like a, a tumor the size of your, the end of your little finger, but um, it does say only about one in a thousand cells escapes immune detection. Bad cells, I mean, that have actually changed to to cancer cells, or they have been initiated and they are abnormal. One in a thousand escapes immune detection, but a tumor the size of the end of your little finger, um, which is about a centimeter, can contain 10 billion cancer cells. And you may see other numbers there. That's a lot of cells. Just a whole, whole bunch of cells. Uh, 10 billion. So impaired immunity can play a, a huge role in that. And, and I think I said earlier in on this uh, page that, like, a, uh, children that are born with no immunity, um, like the, the kids in the bubble, have you ever seen a movie developed in the bubble or whatever? I'm older than young. But he had just lived in the bubble his whole life. But he ended up um, dying of a lymphoma, I think, because this was a real, a, a real person that they were, um, I think he lived to be a teenager. But um, when I worked at Duke, there was a, a research unit near the surgical unit that I, that I worked on. And um, the, there was this little little baby that had been born and, and uh, without an immune system. And so they were trying to do experimental treatments on him and everything, trying to figure out what to do. And he, he lived in a bubble. Um, they, they had a, a special um, special barriers and everything because he, his body wasn't, wasn't um, able to, to uh, prevent him from getting infection and all. But um, what ended up happening was, was his, 
I think his, his mom was a teenager and just wasn't ready for all of this. And, and she just kind of abandoned the child. And so the nurses on that unit were, were his mamas. You know, that's because whoever came in took care of him. They, they loved him and they, he was 34 years old, I think. He, he had been there for those four years. And um, he, was, he was just doing real well um, in that environment. But all of a sudden, he got on the phone and died. And then they just were devastated. It was just the most horrible thing because um, when, when your immune system is not doing that surveillance to, to um, protect your body against cancer cells, even a little child can, can uh, develop cancers. And when you're talking about some of these therapies for like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that that they advertise on television, sometimes they will say there can be an increased risk of cancer development and that's, that's what we're talking about here. So, okay. <clears throat> so, we can have um, lymphatic spread as well, the lymph fluid go through the body, and so that you can get the lymph node and it's starting to start to circulate through the lymphatic fluid and you can get into the bloodstream as well. But the most common sites of where it spreads is lymph nodes, liver, lungs, bones, and brain. And it's estimated that 50 to 60 percent of all cancers have metastasized, metastasized of a fully common tumor. tumor um, was actually found. Okay. Carcinogenesis means cancer creation and that's how it develops, the cancer development. And we said multifactorial. Um, and it's really, really important um, in the, the note page where it says the carcinogenesis, also called oncogenesis, really this, this whole rest of the page is pretty important here, so definitely, definitely put a star by that. Um, but the biggest thing is that all cancers involve mutations of genes. It doesn't mean that your genes were messed up um, from, from your conception or something like that. Sometimes they are, but, but it's, a, it's a either either something that you were, you were born with or um, environmentally exposed to <coughs> there's always from damaged genes. Um, there's always damaged DNA starting the process. And impairment of the immune system, um, you know, we've already mentioned that. And then um, there's tumor associated antigen found on the surface of, of tumor cells that the, the uh, immune system should recognize, but it just it doesn't always. So um, and again this is this is um Real important here. I've got it in the notes, page two. It could be inherited or environmental. There's our there's our phases, um, and then the, the tumor suppressor genes are the ones like a p53 that try to um, uh, <clears throat> to keep in balance and, and um, turn off the reproduction of those abnormal cells. So um, we we talked about the uh, <clears throat> the the toxicity to the genes or the initiation that happens, maybe from viruses and things like that. But carcinogens, that's a big word, um, are substances that change the genetic activity in the cell, so it does become cancerous. So that could be your initiator. And so some, sometimes those are the promoters too, like we said, alcohol and smoke can be both. But they, they do cause mutations in the cellular DNA. And that external ones can be chemicals or radiation, viruses or drugs, that was on the other slide. And then internal can be hormones sometimes. And then um, immune conditions and inherited mutations. So um, you can have, have them um, act together or they may act in sequence to initiate or promote the, the carcinogenesis. And sometimes, in some cancers, it may take 10 or more years between the original mutations, the initiation, and then the detectable cancer. So sometimes people have really had it for a long time uh, before they would ever know it. So um, <clears throat> the um, carcinogens that, that uh, directly alter the DNA called cellular mutations are called genotoxins. Um, and then um, you can have uh, cytotoxicity hormone imbalances and decreased immunity or chronic tissue um, damage that, that can actually be the, the promoters. Okay, and your, your book really goes in a whole lot more in detail than this as well. This is just so many examples. Everybody does come into contact with carcinogenic substances, but not everybody gets cancer. You hear all these people that die at 112 and, and that smoke cigarettes for 
for a hundred years and, and never got lung cancer, you know. And and then I always think, well, you know, I wonder if they'd have lived to, to 150 if they hadn't smoked, you know. So you know, you never know. But uh, but some people's genetic makeup and, and immune system is just so strong that that uh, that sometimes the carcinogenic substances for some people are not for others. And sometimes viruses can damage cells and you know, induce the hyperplastic growth. And, and that's, that's like the, um, the um, HPV, the human papilloma virus. It's, a, it's definitely can be reduced to about now with the um, it can be associated with some form of penile and Poverty, stress, diet, occupation, all those things could can be um, risk factors depending on your situation. Um, age is absolutely the number one risk factor, though. 76% of cancer cases are in people over 80, over 55. Over 55. And then um, the children is just less than 1% of all the new cases. Um, gender for breast cancer is more common in women. Prostate cancer is only in the boys, and then bladder cancer is four times higher in men. Um, poverty, the access to health care, we mentioned that. Um, stress, the epinephrine and, and cortisol um, can get in the care of the immune system. Um, and then diet, there's some foods like nitrates and preserved meat and salt and salt and that, that uh, preserves them, but it certainly can. Some, some changes. It's not, not the best thing for us. It's not if you can eat fresh food, we can't, and we can in this day and time, but, but the, in earlier years they couldn't do that. The high fat and low fiber is associated with colon and breast and sex hormone dependent tumors. Um, the meat that's excessively charred um, is, is not, not real good for your, your GI tract. It's a um, greater incidence of, of um, cancers in the GI tract uh, from when you do the, the charred meats. And then um, <clears throat> some of the red food dyes and saccharin sweeteners and coffee could increase risk in some studies, they say. And then in other studies, they say that coffee and, and um, I don't know about the, the, uh, the food coverings, but they're, they're trying to make food coverings more, more safe as well and for natural substances instead of just um, the invented chemicals. <clears throat> but anyway, the um, coffee and tea have antioxidants in the food. So so I guess you have to decide who you want to believe and drink or don't drink or not. Um, there's actually a, a chart in Iggy on page 404 that will help you with some of that too. But um, occupation may be controllable or uncontrollable. Some people don't have a choice whether they work in the coal mines or something like that. But um, the, the regulations for workplace hazards um, may not be strong enough for some for some people to be able to, to uh, prevent getting, getting cancers. Um, but anyway, uh, farmers have solar radiation. They have a lot of skin cancers and radiology mm -hmm. workers. I, I have ionizing radiation exposure and construction workers may. Um, they run across asbestos and are not protected. Um, and then an old building that you detected are supposed to put all the spacesuits on and all that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of people don't don't enforce that. But that's, that's really what's supposed to happen. So, okay. All right, so in, infections can sometimes cause, cause um, the, a risk. Tobacco and alcohol use can already say recreational drugs, maybe. Um, obesity and some of the radiation and exposure. Um, I can almost just read through the, um, the explanations that I have. But <clears throat> the big key on this page that I want to do right here is a, a primary prevention. That's keeping cancer from occurring at all. And so that means you avoid things that you know could be carcinogens, like, like uh, too much sun and tobacco use, asbestos, um, or moderation, or modification of some of the factors, alcohol and hot fat, low fiber diet, and most sexual partners, and things that, that you can um, be, be careful about, be aware about. Um, and then, then some people will have their at risk tissues removed if they do have. Uh, some of these hereditary uh, conditions. There, there's a, a Lynch syndrome that increases the, the risk of colorectal cancer and uh, <coughs> familial polypocytes, where they, uh, the polyps, if you have polyps at, at a young age, they, they turn into cancer um, at, at a really young age, and it, and it, it can be, they don't have a, a 
friend who was actually my, my brother's ex-girlfriend, married a, a man that died at like 33 and colon mm -hmm. cancer. But um, anyway, the primary prevention, y'all have learned this before, that it is to prevent it from happening at all. You try to do things to keep it from, from happening in the first place. And then where secondary prevention is screening for early detection. Um, and it is the screening. You do have some screening um, standards from the ACS listed in maybe I think or I can't remember if you're getting now. But um, we're going to have an article in, in 211 AD to, to talk about some of this too, that it is controversial with some of the organizations, uh, the National Cancer Institute, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and the American Cancer Society are not a, not in agreement right now about how often to do like mammography and, and um, um, sometimes colonoscopy and, and all this and, and uh, whether to do PSA tests, a screening test anymore for, for um, prostate cancer. So um, that's that's really got got to be a controversial deal and, and pretty much you have to talk to your doctor and decide what about your family history and what about your own history and then what's the best screening um, schedule for, for you because they, they're starting to do fewer pap smears and, and all that too. So, so it, is, it is an individual kind of thing. So, okay. My thumb is just not, not being cooperative. All right, manifestations. So uh, what is a manifestation? doctor would do um, a CBC and, and do some chemistries and all and, and the, they'd see anemia but pretty profound anemia sometimes like eight. You know, it's, it's not supposed to be um, way down to that eight. And so then you start wondering, okay, where did the blood go? And so um, a lot of times they'll do what kind of tests to see where the blood might have gone. Well, he would call, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, what else would be a more detailed test? Because you don't know where the GI tract came from, whether it's upper or lower. Or yeah. just, uh, so you could do like in, endoscopy to upper, or you could do the colonoscopy, or sometimes they'll do both. And then um, a lot of times we saw patients that, that had shown up with their first symptom being anemia or fatigue, and then the anemia that found out that they were anemic, and then they um, that found the colon cancer. So, um, and and uh, the, I mentioned this before too about um, the lung cancer. We see people coming in with pneumonia, but that's where how they had presented was with pneumonia, and then they, um, they took antibiotics and everything, and, and did some follow-up X-rays after the antibiotics that the course had gone through, and they weren't having as many symptoms and everything. And then they then they go in there see see a tumor. Sometimes it just looks like a a, a fuzzy area and consolidation, whatever, and then, then some of that clears and you see a tumor and then they end up doing having to do a bronchoscopy or, or sometimes even just a just a sputum um, cytology to, to see that it, yeah it was a it was a lung cancer. So so you can actually um, find it because you because somebody has an infection. So um, liver function can be messed up and, and um, the nutritional the, the may be down, something like that. So that may be a sign that you need to, to see if something's wrong with the liver. Um, and then uh, pressure um, on the liver from the tumors can be caused portal hypertension and ascites and varices. Uh, now, some of y'all have seen ascites. Um, does anybody, can anybody explain what ascites is? What's that? A fluid in the belly. Yeah, yeah. And you can have that from ovarian cancer too. But when you've got somebody that's a, been an alcoholic a long time and has has what condition? 
cirrhosis. He had a lot of cirrhosis patients had ascites too, because uh, that's the same same type of thing. You got some, some uh, damage to the liver, and then the varices. Um, usually think about that as, as esophagus. That uh, sometimes people that, that uh, drink a lot of alcohol, or, or people that have the liver problems too, and it sort of backs up the good pressure um, on the esophageal uh, vessels. You can have they they really are um, enlarged, um, swollen vessels, and it's, it's real easy. But they're very very vascular there, and um, if one of those vessels blows or, or there's a tumor or something that erodes into that, then then um, then you could actually actually exsanguinate and bleed to death. Mm -hmm. So um, impaired function of blood cells can be um, due to the production of a lot of mature white blood cells in leukemia. You've got loads of white blood cells, but they're not doing what they're supposed to do. The function is altered. And don't they don't protect the immunity. And over overcrowding of the bone marrow from a lot of WBC production can can cause um, uh, decrease in the red blood cells and platelets. We talked about that in our hematology <coughs> section. And we have anemia and clotting problems. GI tumors um, keep you from absorbing um, vitamin B12 and, and iron uh, needed for the RBC production. So um, there's there all kinds of purines, folates that, that can compromise the, the normal uh, blood cell uh, production if, if the, the tumors are taking, taking in all of those kinds of building blocks for our amino um, acids. And then infection, if you've got develop a, a bladder or bowel fistula. Y'all heard the word fistula before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joints to like a um, sort of a tunnel or something to have joints two organs uh, together. And, and uh, the bladder is um, not supposed to have organisms in it. It's, I mean, that's, that's supposed to be sterile. And if it's uh, joint to the bowel, what kind of infection are we going to have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, really could go to pyelonephritis or, and bring a renal failure, possibly, if, if it um, is detected quickly enough to, to get uh, straightened out. So, so anyway, there, there's lots of, lots of potentials there. Okay. I'm still got it. All right. And then we said the hemorrhage, erosion through the blood vessels, and you can have an anemia. And, and that could, it could also go to hypovolemic shock if you're really having a lot of blood loss. Anorexia and cataxia. We pretty much know what anorexia is what. They're eating. Yeah, loss of appetite. I mean, that's really the, the definition of loss of appetite. And then cataxia means that you just look like you've been in this concentration camp for several years. You just, just waste away. It really is just wasting. Um, the neoplastic cells divert the nutrition, that means the cancer cells uh, divert the nutrition to the, the cells and then so they, they rob the, the rest of the body from, from nutrition. There can be pain and, and infection and that can to make people not hungry or some things just don't taste good to people with cancer, especially like um, red meat seems to just, just be a really, people have an aversion to that and I heard so many people say that sometimes it's because of the cancer and sometimes it's because of the treatment that they'll say, um, it just tastes really, really nasty, or, or it just tastes like wood. Or the more I chew, the bigger it gets, and, and that it's just really, it's just not something that, that people uh, won't want to eat a lot of times when they have cancer. Um, and you, you can also alter the taste and smell, and you can um, you can have early satiety. You can, you can get full too quickly before you really get enough to, to uh, nourish your body. And then um, you can have a widespread um, metabolism. We talk, we talk about an anabolism, anabolic steroids. An, anabolic means what? Build mm -hmm. to, to building with anabolic mm -hmm. margin. You're building with the tumor. You go with catab catabolism. That's that's breaking down tissue. So, and then that makes the people have that cachectic look. Um, and you have increased destruction and decreased intake, and that's cachexia. And then I have that word dis. Guja, which means a distortion of taste from cancer or treatments, and so that can that can make you don't want to eat either. So nutrition is a is a big deal. All right, and perineoplastic syndrome that can that's like the chemicals that are produced by the tumor or or chemicals that are produced by organs that the tumor has told to turn on um, production of a, a certain hormone that, that the body doesn't really need. It can be pain. We're going to talk more about pain into it. I mean, we so we not go into that so much. Uh, physical and psychological stress, we're going to need to have this section as well. Um, and it's 
sites of the increased hormone production, like parathyroid hormone or hypercalcemia, um, um, ad, uh, adrenocortic hormone can be for increased cortisone, um, and you can have all other side effects that like you would have if you were taking, um, taking cor um, corticosteroids. And um, then the antidiuretic hormone, that can cause, uh, well sometimes the first sign of that is that of certain kinds of lung cancer, uh, and sometimes lymphomas is that you have a low sodium, and it's because of ectopic uh, production of the antidiuretic uh, um, And you can also have hematologic abnormalities in the kidney and skin and neurologic syndromes because of, of hormone stimulation. Um, and then I'll let you, I'll let you all read about the pain for but we are going to you know, emphasize that more in, in, the, in the next course. And, One of our exemplars for this semester, or this course, is anticipatory grieving, and I'll let you read through that too. I know that that's something that that um, Ms. Rumbles had you read about, right? I thought I saw that on your assignment about anticipatory grieving, but that that can be about a lot of things, can it? I mean, uh, you can you can have um, anticipatory grieving, you know, for for somebody that you love that, that has cancer, or you can have anticipatory grieving and as, just as a, um, the, the patient with cancer themselves, just like, um, what if I don't live to see my children graduate from high school? What if I don't live to see my first grandchild? What, what if I don't, don't make it to my 50th okay, birthday? Okay, there's just all kinds of things that you can have an anticipatory grieving about even before you really know what what stage you're in or what your prognosis is, there's all kinds of grieving that can take, take place um, beforehand. So, um, but it, it even says the, the uh, definition that your um, adjustment of self concept in the face of potential loss, death, loss of body parts, dysfunction, loss of a significant person, animal, or possessions, or loss of a social loss. Because some people may have anticipatory grieving because. They know that, that they're going to die and who's going to take care of, of their pet. You know, that's, that's a real big deal to a lot of people. It definitely is. And some people go you in, know, you know, I guess, I bet Shannon can tell us about this, about the New Orleans thing. There were so many people that, that didn't want to leave because they weren't going to leave their pets. They, because they wouldn't let their pets go on the bus to, to get out of New Orleans, even though they had a way out. They didn't want to go because they didn't want to leave, lose their pet. Um, but anyway, that we do have lots and lots and lots of potential diagnostic tests depending on where the cancer is so that you can certainly have biopsy. That's the only way to really know if it's cancer is if you look under the microscope and see the, the abnormal cells. It doesn't have to be a biopsy. It can be a cytology and you can see the abnormality like if it's a sputum sample or something like that. Um, but bone marrow aspiration is, is for the, the, you remember the, the Charlie Brown? little video and she talked about having some of her bone marrow taken. She said she had some, some blood taken and the blood looked abnormal and so but then she had a bone marrow um, aspiration. She said it hurt. So then you can have CAT scans, um, MRIs, PET scans, um, and just regular x-rays, ultrasounds, body fluid studies, um, and that's where you can get, get cytology. Um, a lot of times you can get washings from the bronchial tubes, and or you can get washings from the, the peritoneal area as well. And and then we, we did mention the, the uh, direct visualization. That just means you're putting the light, the light in. That's what we always say. Go in with the light. It makes uh, patients understand where the endoscopy, colonoscopy, cystoscopy. Where was the cystoscopy? Cyst, but they, they really weren't sure what, what exactly was going on there. 
Then they found out by, by, um, <clears throat> by doing the washings or getting samples of that, um, uh, what was in the, in the cyst itself. So, the, but the, the main thing, I have it in bold and underlined, um, only microscopic histologic examination of the tissue reveals the type of cell and its structural difference from the parent tissue. So there's loads and loads and loads of blood tests that you can have. I mean, CBC is done just really, really frequently. Um, there, there can be some tumor marker tests. Um, so for like PSA is a tumor marker for um, like pro it's prostate specific antigen, but that, that's a um, hormone test you can have. And, and um, there's one called carcinoembryonic antigen or um, a CEA test, and there's a CA15-3, CA19-9, there's, there's all kinds of uh, antigens that can be on the surface of, of cancer cells. And they can, a lot of times it's not diagnostic though, it may be better. Um, like a PSA may be diagnostic, but um, sometimes that you can use those tumor markers just to follow, um, see what they are, if like CEA is elevated in colon cancer, and then you start a treatment regimen, or you have surgery and then you do chemotherapy and all, and then, then you recheck the, the CEA, and if it's, if it's dropped a lot, if it was really high, if it was like 800 or something like that, and it dropped to up to 12, it's like, wow, we've really, we've really eliminated a lot of the cells that have that mark on there, and we're doing we're some good. So, why don't you do the for following? Um, and uh, it is, let's see, I, you know, you need to know about albumin, calcium, CDA, PSA, and sodium, and what those, those can see in our body. Okay. Um, and then there's a actually came from, from the uh, National uh, Cancer Institute website. I, I used this for um, when I was preparing for my exam for, for the oncology certified nurse uh, certification. And um, the, it was it had a book called Understanding the Immune System, and, and um, but it it had all kinds of like cancers and everything listed too. But uh, it, it's really the, really really good. That website is, is wonderful. You can look up all kinds of, of things on there. But there is an Understanding Cancer series um, as well that has lots of um, powerpoints and everything that are that are worded to where the the general public can un understand them. Um, uh, and, and so, some of it might be a little, um, little <clears throat> confusing to somebody that doesn't have a medical background, but, but it's a lot easier than some, some of your textbooks are, I think. But anyway, this is, is I think it's really good for y'all to know. Y'all don't really get a medical terminology course, do you? Have y'all learned these prefixes and all before? Well, some of them. Mm -hmm. You do get some of them there. So, so I think a lot of them you, you probably do know, but just sort of go, go through those just so that you'll be somewhat um, and then, and then now I'm not going to necessarily give you a, the test question on, on this. It's just that when you look at a pathology report and, and you've got some of those things on there and you don't know what it is, it, it's so easy now to just Google it, just look it up, and, and you can find it about, about anywhere. But, but if you don't know what it is, do look it up because that, that will help to, to explain what's really going on with your, your patient. So um, anyway, the, the carcinomas actually do um, arise from... It says the endoderm, embryonal endoderm and ectoderm, but that's epithelial tissue. That's what we're talking about. Um, and that, that um, uh, carcinoma is, is uh, and you can have like adenocarcinoma would be from a gland joint. Then you see that adeno is from gland. Um, a lot of breast cancer <coughs> adeno. Um, like pancreatic cancer, and little cancer can be. There can be adenocarcinoma in lung. Um, any place that has gland joint tissue, there, there may be. That adeno um, prefix, you know, you can kind of, kind of uh, relate it together. Um, and, and again, you'll be memorized memorize that, but it's just, it's just helpful to, to just have repetition of seeing that so that you know that what you're looking at. And then the www.cancer.gov is the NCI website. All right. Uh, there goes my phone again. All right. <clears throat> Classification. Clinical staging, and, and again, this is this controversial thing. Are they even going to call it cancer in situ that, that when it's sort of walled off and it has not become invasive yet? The cells in there could invade, but they have not yet. So that is still called called zero stage. 
but um, the, it, it, if it's stage one, the tumor's limited to the, the tissue of origin. Um, stage two, limited local spread. Stage three, extensive local and regional. And stage four is metastasis. So um, whenever you see stage four, in some cancers, that means they're not going to be curable at all. But there are some cancers that, that can be cured, like, like Hodgkin's disease and, and testicular cancer can be, be cured with, um, uh, with chemotherapy and all. We talked about, about Lance Armstrong in, in our clinical conferences. Did we tell you about the erythropoietin and all that kind of thing? He, we were saying he may have needed erythropoietin at some point as to, to try to treat his anemia from his cancer therapy, and maybe that's how he found out it made him feel so good and perform so well, and, and it may not have been necessarily intentional to begin with, but um, it just allowed, allowed him to exercise. But then, then, then once he knew that it was illegal, and he, he still did it, we, we talked about that a whole lot. But, but um, he actually had, it, had some brain metastasis and, and was cured. So that, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And it, it, can, it can happen with Hodgkin's disease as well. But there are some, like with breast cancer and lung cancer and liver cancer and some of, some of those organ-related, uh, um, other organ-related cancers, it, it's usually not curable when it goes to stage four. So it's not good, though. The, the higher the stage, the worse it is. And so that, that's what you need to, to know the, the most. Um, and in, on, in Iggy, it, it talks about grading, um, the grade of the cancer, and it's in Table 23-5. I think I put that in your notes. I just wrote it in online. But again, the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis and the, the more difficult it is to treat. And that, that determines how, how functionally mature the cells are, how close are they to the normal tissue that, that it came from the cells that are in the tissue that it came from and are they are they able to function the way that, that the that the normal tissue would, would function. So um, differentiation means um, how how malignant or aggressive the, the tumor is. Um, and we talked about those embryonic cells that could become any tissue in the whole body. They have they were pluripotent, not just blood stem cells, but they were pluripotent, any, any kind of body cell. So, um, so those were, were definitely undifferentiated. That's the only time, again, that, that you're, you should have undifferentiated cells is when it's embryonic, period. And, that, and any time they're undifferentiated and they don't know what their function is supposed to be and they're not performing any functions, then, then it's abnormal and it's, it's not, not a good thing. So the only thing that's good to be high is if you have, have a high degree of differentiation, meaning that you are high, the, the cells are highly functional. Um, so so if, you, if, the, if it is well differentiated, then, then that means that, that, that it is good, and that the cell is not, is not as abnormal. But if it's poorly differentiated, it doesn't know what it's supposed to do or can't perform any function, then that's, that, that's bad. But, but high differentiation level or well differentiated is, is a good thing. But high stage, high grade, high doubling time, or high mitotic index, all of those are bad. So, so that's, that's the way, if you can just look at the, high, the higher numbers are bad. But well differentiated is good. Um, poorly differentiated, of course, is not good. But um, doubling time means how, how fast it, it, um, it turns over and, and doubles the number of cells, sort of like you saw in the, in the embryonic. Um, stage and then the mitotic index means how many cells are undergoing mitosis at any particular time. So, all right, and this is just another picture of the chaos, and here you got the um, you've got this blood supply, this angiogenesis going on, so it's stealing uh, nutrients, this tumor stealing nutrients from. Uh, from the from normal cells uh, around it, and then it's breaking through and, and escaping. So um, uh, this is just another another one of those those anarchy sort of things, the the lack of lack of control. Um, and I think oh, the one thing on on the this notice page, I can think we said most of this already, but there there's a a chemical attraction called chemotaxis. And it, that they they think that some the reason that some cancers go to certain organs is because those particular organs um, 
want to to take those cells in for some reason that, that um, and it's not really well understood but um, it says a chemical attraction may cause the malignant cells to target a specific site and but it is called chemotaxis and again it's not that's not something that I ever learned in the um, you know when, when I first started out in oncology but that's just that's one of the things that they just learned about that it, it may may be an attraction and then this is another one, this, the, the chaos and everything. Here's the, um, the vascularization. You've got to see all the blood vessels in here. And then the blood vessels get penetrated and the, the cells escape. And then, then here we go and, and it's going to invade other, other areas. So um, anyway, that, that's just, these are all really the same, the same thing, but just in, you know, pictured in different, different ways. Um, and the chemotaxis chemicals and cells that coax tumor cells into the particular tissue. I think that's actually in, I can't remember where it says, but I think it's in this, this, um, well, maybe it's not. But anyway, that, that's, that's what we're, we're looking at, though, is that it, it may be attracted to certain, certain kind of um, tissues. Gosh, I just really thought that it was, that it was in there somewhere. Oh, well. <clears throat> it applies to it anyway. Okay, let's do, do a few more um, kind of classification type things. And we'll get to our nursing stuff on, on Thursday. <clears throat> the TNM classification of staging has to do with tumor size. The T is for tumor size. And the N is the spread to lymph nodes, and then the M is the um, any metastatic areas. And so th this is um, in Giddens, page 97, and it's also in Table 23-6 in Higgy. So it, it, it's really I don't want you to to think you have to be really um, know every fine detail about it, but just just so you know what that T and M is talking about. Um, if you've got a T with a high number beside it, that's, that's probably not good, is it? Because <laughs> anything that's, if the tumor's big, it's going to have a higher number beside it. And so the lower the number, if it's, uh, if it's a 1, um, then, then you know that's going to be a whole lot better than a 5 or something. So, and then the nodes, um, the, the number, the number of, of nodes listed, if, it's, if that's high, then, um, then that's, that's a, a lower, uh, that's, that means a, a less favorable prognosis and if there's any M that's that's not good either so um, so that's that's really the the, the biggie you know, how, how you interpret that the, the T means tumor the N means nodes the M means metastasis the higher the number the worse it is so and that's really basically what I want you to know from that um, okay and this, this gets a little mumbo jumbo in this notes page but it says a less aggressive tumor it's going to be a lower stage with the TNM method. The, the numbers will be low, and then it'll be highly differentiated, which means a low-grade cancer. And it'll have a long doubling time. It won't reproduce really quickly. And then it'll have a low mitotic index, meaning not that many cells are in the division process at any one time. So, so just kind of read over that a few times to, to grasp what we're talking about there. And then on the other hand, an aggressive cancer has higher numbers on the TNM. And if any metastasis is there beyond the regional lymph nodes, that's considered a, a stage four, which was said is not a great prognostic factor. Um, but if it's undifferentiated, undifferentiated, unlike the tissue of origin, or lower non-existent functional maturity, that's, that's not good. And it, it is high grade, so high grade is bad. And the doubling time would be rapid and the mitotic index would be high. So, so just read through the differences there so it doesn't, doesn't get you mixed up. Really, the only thing that's good is high level of functionality and differentiation. That's, that's good. But that makes sense, doesn't it? If it's differentiated, it knows what to do, and it's mature, and, and um, if, if it's undifferentiated, it doesn't, doesn't know what to do. Okay, and this is just another, <laughs> another one of my crazy pictures the right way here. Um, there, oh, gosh, my thumb's just clumsy. 
All right, cancer tends to corrupt the surrounding <coughs> environment. That really does look like corruption, doesn't it? I think mm -hmm. that, that's why I want to show you all these, because I, I know these are saying the same thing. But here we're talking about like our cytokines that, that tell um, tell the body what what to do, tell the immune system what to do. Uh, proteases, those are those are dissolving some protein, so you've got enzymes working here. Um, and there, there's just all kinds of, this, these are normal, then you got this one, bad one, and then all that, that corruption and, and chaos happens. Um, and I think a lot of that we've already pretty much talked about. I'm going to go to the, come on, um, all right, I, I really think this is, this is a, a really good slide too. Primary tumor, our angiogenesis is our blood vessels forming. Capillaries and venules and lymphatics, or the, the, it goes into to those other tissue areas, um, and then we got multi uh, multi cell aggregates going. It's not just one. Well, you can have just one cell travel, but but sometimes you'll have multiple cells that break off and travel, and then it stops in the circulation, and then it adheres um, in in the tissues. And, and then um, penetrates into the, the, the organ. Well, that, well, that's it here, it's into the blood vessels. And then this goes into the organ itself. Um, and then the tumor cell proliferates and, and the angiogenesis happens in, in this metastatic area. So that's really a, that's really a pretty scary process. Um, this in my sight, so yeah. <clears throat> All right. I think this is this is a really good slide too. Brain and and um, I think it's a meninges there. Lungs, liver, um, and adrenals in the bone. Um, what do you think this one is? Spine. Yeah, and this one's pretty Brain. obvious too. And what about that? What's that? Lungs. Yeah. And, um, and what about there's there's two little ones there? Yeah, they they really. Um, you know, what kind of things would happen if your adrenal glands aren't functioning right? And there's a lot of stuff that comes in there, like cortisone and cortisol, and and the um, and, and what what's the other thing? Adrenaline. And benefit like with like kind of things so you know, I think that's our, that's our, our deal. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop.